Hello, everyone. Hello. Good. We'll give folks a few more minutes to jump on. Hope everyone's having a nice afternoon. Welcome to the new people, folks who just came in. We're gonna give people until 3.02 to join us. Until, I'm sorry, until 1.02 to join us. We'll start in about a minute.
Okay, everyone. We should be, we're just over 20 people, so other people will drift in, but it's about time to start to make sure that we are going to go in a timely manner. So welcome everyone. Let's talk about best practices for hybrid workers for you as managers. So this training on hybrid work best practices, this is the second training. There was an earlier one in the fall, it went really well. So this is a reprise of the training customized to your needs. We'll be going through some of the best practices on hybrid work, how they apply to government leaders, state government leaders in Canada, so provincial government leaders in Canada. So that's gonna be what the focus is about. Hopefully you're there at training. Okay, anytime you have a question, just pop it into the chat. I'll be happy to take questions into the chat. So we'll have plenty of time for questions. I'll also, what we'll be doing is we'll be using breakout groups. So you'll have a chance to discuss what I talk about with your colleagues. So there's gonna be plenty of that as well. Now, if you, if there is something weird going on, if you can't hear me for some reason, you are welcome to turn on your audio and interrupt me and tell me that something is weird is going on. But had that happened before when there was a misconnection or something. Also, if you don't see my slides clearly, you should go to speaker view and put it in full view speaker view and make sure it's set in full screen so that you see my slides clearly. So this is going to be the slides. This is going to be the slides changing. So make sure that you're able to see the slides clearly. Now, after the training, I will provide you with the resources from this presentation. So some post presentation resources, including a copy of my book and other presentation resources I'll mention during this presentation. So you can anticipate that. All right. Oh, um, I should mention, we'll be taking breaks every 30-ish, 40 minutes or so. So there'll be a chance to take a break. That's when you can do, in, do a physical, mental break. I advise you to get up, take a walk around. This is definitely a best practice, talking about hybrid work best practices. Take a physical break, get up, walk around. I'll be doing that myself. I'll get some tea or something whatever you want, and maybe do a little meditation, take a mental break, whatever fits your needs. But yes, don't simply take the time to check your email. But if you need to check your email, that's the time to do that, not during the presentation. So you can anticipate that there will be time to check your email, do things like that. All right, everyone. So let's go ahead and talk about what this training will cover. We'll go over 12 topics. First, the data on hybrid work. Then typical judgment errors that government leaders make around hybrid work. Then we'll talk about how to collaborate effectively when you're working in hybrid work settings, including on collaboration. Then we'll talk about some innovation, how to innovate effectively. Then we'll talk about communication collaboration norms. So first we'll talk about some techniques, the virtual co-working, virtual brainstorming, and then more broadly, developing norms and expectations. Next, we'll move on to effective remote meetings and then effective hybrid meetings. Then we'll go on to the very important topic of performance management in hybrid settings. Next, hybrid coaching. So supervisory relationships, this is not mentoring, this is coaching. And then we'll touch on mentoring. So non-supervisory relationships, peer to peer. Next, we'll go to how do you facilitate cross-departmental team. By department, I just mean work unit. So outside of your team, across teams, how do you facilitate cross-team collaboration and coordination? And finally, bringing this all together in formulating team-level guidelines around hybrid work. So that's going to be the shape of the presentation. That's what you can anticipate. Without further ado, Let's launch into it. So first, data on hybrid work. I'll share with you on significant data from a number of major independent surveys that have come out 
from organizations like the Society for Human Resource Management, like Harvard Business School, organizations that don't have any stake in the outcome of the data. They, they just want the best data possible. And what this data shows is that 75 to 85% of workers who are remote capable don't want traditional office-centric work. 25 to 35% want full-time remote work. So this is a pretty big number, and you might be surprised to see it's that big. But that is just what we are pretty clearly seeing. We are seeing that very many workers don't run traditional office-centric work, meaning Monday for Friday, 9 to 5, and a large number want full-time remote work. So in other words, 15 to 25% of remote capable employees want Monday through Friday, nine to five in the office, 25 to 35% want full-time remote work, but that means that the majority, 50 to 60% want hybrid work of some sort. So some time in the office, usually it will be less than half the work week in the office, something like two days. 40 to 55% would leave their job if forced to come in full-time. That's a pretty high number. Over 70% are less likely to leave if offered substantial remote work. So what are the implications here? And this is surveys, but we're seeing that happen in real life quite extensively. So here's a Toronto Star article that came out just over a week ago that I wrote. And it's very relevant to all of you. It's titled, Why Leaders Need to Be Cautious with a Mandated Return to the Office for Government Workers. And here's the thing. Oh, so, ah, monthly limit. Let's see. I'll see if I can uh, open it somewhere else. That's amusing that they're not allowing me to do it. Okay, here, I open it in another browser. Um, let's see if I can open it in another browser. There you go. Hmm. Okay, so you should be able to see it in this browser. So again, I wrote this article just about 10 days ago. And what it talks about is where there is, was a strike by the Office for National Statistics in the UK. It mandated a 40% office attendance, meaning two days a week in the office. So there was a mandate for two days a week in the office, and it led to significant unrest among staff with a strike vote, with more than 70% of the commercial public and commercial services union with a 50% turnout. So this is a strike. So this is very much what's happening there. And we can see that happening. And this is why it's pretty dangerous to just have this calls for people to go in the office. For example, you probably heard that uh, Premier Doug Ford appealed to the federal government for a free day office return to stimulate Ottawa's downtown core. And this, of course, is the kind of thing that led to a strike vote in the UK. And it's quite, quite the professional institutes of the public service of Canada is really criticizing Premier Doug Ford for that, saying that it's not a good idea, that you want to have presence with a purpose over blanket mandates, and you don't want to have a one-size-fits-all approach. So this is really important. And that's what I wrote the article about. I can share it in the chat in case you want to check it out. So this data, in other words, is borne out very much among government workers. And we're seeing this happen, of course, in the UK. The UK has a lot of similarities to Canada. Canada actually has more people working remotely overall 
than the UK does on a per capita basis. So per capita, Canada has more work days worked remotely than the UK. And that is a pretty big danger in terms of retention, recruitment, and labor unrest. Partially, it's People really like working from home. We know that working from home improves people's well-being. Mostly at fully remote work, people report from these surveys make over 75% happier, over 70% less stressed, and over 75% better able to manage work-life balance. So this is pretty clear. And we know that people are much more likely to be happier in this setting. And I'll share another article that I wrote that came out just literally today with some new research on hybrid work and mental health. And what it showed, it's a research at the University of Pittsburgh. It looked at U.S. states, which, of course, are pretty similar to what's happening in Canada. And what they find is that they used professional level data from Mental Health America, which collects data from over 5 million mental health screens. So pretty professional assessments, not just self-reported data. So the data I gave you is self-reported. This is professional healthcare screen. And what it found is that more very recent data, not simply from the pandemic, that states with a higher percentage of flexible firms show considerably lower rates of depression. Mississippi, for example, where only 52% of employers allow either hybrid or remote work, has a depression rate of about 50% higher than Massachusetts, which offers remote work to 84% of all employers. South Carolina and North Carolina are states that are very similar. You know, Mississippi and Massachusetts are distinct in many ways. South Carolina and North Carolina are very similar. In South Carolina, 66% of firms offer flexibility. In North Carolina, 71% do. And North Carolina has a 17% lower rate of depression. Now, I live in Ohio, where 65% of all employers provide flexibility. Pennsylvania, just next door, very similar, 73%. And Pennsylvania has 12% less depression. And so I can share with you, take a look a look at the research itself, and there are some good charts there. And they show this negative, very clear negative association between depression rates and flexibility. So again, going from the, at the left is the, the horizontal axis is the percent of firms offering flexibility from around 50% to 85%. And the vertical axis is depression rate. So we see with this line that the more flexibility, the less depression. That's called the negative association between depression rates and flexibility. And other, other research also shows the same thing, hybrid flexibility. I'll also put those into the chat for those who want to check it out. So we could pretty clearly see that mental health is improved, not only retention, recruitment, we see less labor action, conflicts, mental health, well-being. Now, remote work does have some challenges. With over 50% of people feeling overworked, over 55% experiencing burnout, more for young adults, and over 80% wanting fewer meetings, if the techniques used for remote work and hybrid work are by people who haven't been trained on how to do hybrid work effectively. And this is one of the reasons you're being trained on this topic, right? We've been see surveys that show that over 70% of managers have not been trained, and they tend to use the tools that they know, which is natural, to from office-based settings to applying them to remote work, to hybrid work. And that causes problems, with the biggest issues being poor virtual communication skills and technology issues. So people have a lot of challenges around these areas. Now, 
The next topic is productivity. So I'll talk about some peer reviewed randomized trials. But before I talk about productivity, are there any questions about retention, recruitment, well being, remote work challenges, and labor unrest in government settings? And by the way, I've done a number of consulting engagements for Canadian provinces and training engagements. So I'm quite familiar with what's going on in Canada. So happy to answer questions. Yes, Barbara, please go ahead. You can unmute yourself, hey. you can put it into the chat, whatever is comfortable for you. Perfect, thank you. Um, I was just curious, when you say that 70% of all managers have been trained. Um, Haven't been managers, trained. Oh, have not been trained. And um, not been we're trained. like, what's managers where like GNWT is this federal is this oh so this is the broad survey uh, managers broadly so not broadly. in uh yep yep perfect thank you so much you're very welcome So I'll show you the specific survey. So this is a survey by TechSmith. It where nearly three out of four responders indicate their employer has not trained its managers to lead a distributed team. So you can take a look at the specific survey here. And this is well, was done in the US, but uh, and somebody asked me in the chat about Canada. Canada is pretty similar to the US in this regard. So Canada, UK, and the US are pretty similar in how they approach these topics. So there, you're not gonna find too many differences on the extent of training and on the surveys. Further questions before I go on? Don't see any in the chat. I don't see any, anyone unmuting themselves. Good. Let's see. All right, if not, then we'll go on. Uh, actually, maybe I can find one data point on Canada. Hold on. I'd be of interest. Anyway, I'll take. Uh, Scott X asks, we are in a remote part of Canada, does remoteness factor in? So in re more remote areas, there are going to be more people who are generally working remotely, and it's going to be easier to hire people who are working remotely. So yeah, it, it does factor in somewhat, and that makes it especially important to think about remote work and flexibility. Here is a specifically Canadian data point that's pretty recent. So this is April 24th. And so this is a Canada Managing Director. It surveyed 2,000 white collar professionals from 500 companies across Canada. It found that 46% would threaten to switch jobs if asked, if asked to increase their in-office workday. So in other words, not if not full days, not full time, and if just in, 
has to increase. Any increase from their current status, 46% would threaten to switch jobs. And so that's, again, very current data just came out well, two weeks ago. Okay, well, let's go on. So let's talk about some research on productivity. This is an important question. I got this question was asked in depth in my previous uh, training. So I gave some, I integrated some more research peer reviewed trials into this training. And it's going, what I'll talk about is specifically again, peer reviewed trials. This is the golden standard, gold standard on what we can determine around productivity in hybrid and remote settings. So let's talk about what's happening in terms of productivity. And please do make sure to keep yourself on mute. Thank you. So peer-reviewed randomized trial. This is published by the National Bureau of Economic Research. And here's a link. I'll share the slides with you so you can take a look at the links if you want. It's about a major travel agency with 35,000 staff. And it wanted to measure the impact of hybrid work versus in-office work. It's not fully work from home, but hybrid work. This was three days a week hybrid work. Collaborate with Stanford University on a randomized trial. Here's what they did. They assigned staff in their airfare and IT divisions, half of the staff to a full-time schedule. So again, Monday for Friday, nine to five in the office, the typical full-time schedule. And this was staff with even numbered birthdays. And they assigned staff with odd numbered birthdays to a flexible arrangement of hybrid work three days a week in the office. Again, they didn't make any other substantial changes. They didn't do any training for managers. They didn't do any policy changes to adapt to hybrid work. They just did this change. This was the only change that they did. This was forced assignment. So randomized assignment, as you can see, very clear randomization. What they found when they used two metrics, so two metrics of productivity, so thinking about what metrics of productivity to use, one was an objective metrics of lines of code written for programmers. Another was more subjective or manager assessment of performance. And they also measured other things like retention, engagement, sick days, but I'm going to be focusing on productivity here. So what did they find? They found that managers didn't see any different any differences in performance. The ones who are hybrid, the ones who are fully in office, managers saw their performance as the same. But that's not what actually happened. In reality, the hybrid group had a higher productivity. They had 4% more lines of code written, over 4% more lines of code written. So 4% higher productivity is quite good. And that should have been something that managers noticed, but managers didn't notice. They were not trained to assess hybrid work productivity, so they didn't notice it. Other research shows pretty clearly that there's a slight boost in productivity for hybrid work overall, depending on the type of work and so on. But overall, there's going to be a slight boost in productivity for hybrid work. What about other metrics? The hybrid group had a huge boost in retention, 33% improvement in retention. Now imagine for your own workers, what would happen if they had a bad sort of boost retention? That would be great. You save a lot of money and it's definitely good for your culture and collaboration. So big boost in retention. And they had fewer sick days, which of course helps them improve, explain their productivity. They work longer. Rank and file workers had higher satisfaction, but managers had lower satisfaction, likely because they weren't trained in hybrid work management. So that's one trial. Second peer review trial, also published by the National Bureau of Economic Review. It's about, so previous, I focused on programmers, so high paid, white collar job. Here we have a low paid, white collar job, staff at a call center. They were given a chance to apply for work from home, then half were randomly chosen to do home, half stayed in the office. Work from home, this was mostly work from home. So this was one day a week in the office for this group. Again, they didn't make any substantial changes to adapt to work from home or train managers on this topic. What metrics did they use? They used three metrics of productivity, minutes worked per shift, calls per minute, and manager assessment of performance. 
they also measured retention and satisfaction. What did they find? Over nine months of the trial, or the previous trial was six months, this was nine months. Over nine months, the work from home group had a 13% performance increase, so even better than the other group. Nine minutes from because they worked more time per shift, and that was attributed to fewer breaks, fewer sick days, which is understandable because they didn't need to take as many sick days because some days they would have taken sick if they were in the office, they were able to work. And also at 4% more productivity for more calls per minute, likely because of a quieter working environment. But managers, once again, as in the previous study, they didn't see any difference in their performance. So managers couldn't see the difference in their performance. Again, likely because they weren't trained on how to assess performance in hybrid work settings. Other metrics. The office group attrition over nine months was 35%. The work from home group attrition was 17%, 50% decline in attrition, which is amazing. That's a huge, huge decline in attrition. But the promotion rate they conditioned on performance decreased. In other words, looking at their performance, the productivity, the promotion rate didn't match. It was worse for the group from home, working from home. Again, because managers weren't able to assess effectively their performance. So what are the implications from these trials? Well, you need to figure out metrics that are going to be smart. And I know that that's already encouraged you know, in the infrastructure department to figure out these metrics. Specific, measurable, actionable, relevant, and time bound because otherwise you're not really going to be able to measure the performance of people who are working in a hybrid modality or in a fully remote modality. Again, they're not there, you can't see them work, and it's very hard to assess their performance as we saw from the previous two trials if you don't have appropriate metrics and training. Man the metrics will often not align well with manager performance evaluations because managers just can't see workers. And so they make mistakes when evaluating their performance. That's why managers like you need to be trained in developing and using effective metrics. If they lack training, they'll often underestimate the performance of those who work remotely or in a hybrid modality. Okay, questions at this stage. I do have one more trial uh, to share, but I want to see if there are any questions at this stage before going to that peer review trial. Okay, don't see any questions, let's go on. These methods and results don't tell the whole story. They very clearly show higher productivity for those working in hybrid or remote environments, but the measures of productivity here, you remember the lines of code written, calls per minute, that's about individually oriented work. We want to ask the question about collaborative, work, which is of course quite important for the Department of Infrastructure. So talk about, let's talk about that. Here's a Harvard University working paper that studied software engineers at Fortune 500 firms. So again, software engineers, similar to our pre first example, and there's definitely gonna be some software engineers and similar workers or expert technical workers. So think of that, well-paid expert technical workers who are remote capable. So this was a study that started before the pandemic, which was great that we had that, and then continued into the pandemic. This Fortune 500 firm had a main campus with two buildings, several blocks apart from each other. And they had some team members from the same team in one building and some team members on the same team in different buildings. Not sure why, that's the way they had it. It's fortunate for us. They evaluated feedback given to each other as a measure of collaboration and learning, programming output as a measure of productivity and then retention. They found that engineers who worked in the same building as all of their teammates. So if you work in the same building as your whole team, then you will get more feedback. On average, 22% more feedback in their online tool that they used for collaboration compared to engineers with teammates, some teammates who are in another building. After offices closed for COVID-19, the advantage narrowed to 8%. So in other words, if you 
first start working collaboratively together, then you move on to working remotely, you'll still have more of that sense of collaboration than you had when you were working, you know, if you started working together remotely in the first place. So that's an important point that it's beneficial for young people, young staffers to spend more time building relationships, perhaps in person, but focusing on building relationships and then they can spend more time working remotely. Sitting together in the same buildings does the reduce programming output by 24%, especially for senior engineers by 39% because senior engineers provided more feedback to junior engineers. And this is especially important for women because they both did more mentoring, providing more feedback and received more mentoring, got more feedback. This proximity impacts career trajectories. In the short run, it dampens pay raises. So you'll have lower pay raises because you're less productive. But in the long run, you'll have higher pay raises and you'll have higher retention. So the implication here is that individual measures of productivity are not going to be enough. You need to measure team productivity to learn about the true impact, including mentoring and learning over time. Okay, questions about the study. Okay, no questions. Cool. Let's go on to the next topic, which is the decision-making errors that leaders and employees tend to make around hybrid work and remote work. Cognitive biases, this is my area of expertise, this is my background, decision-making. So cognitive bias, decision-making in the future of work specifically. So cognitive biases are the errors we make because of how our mind is wired. Our mind is not actually wired for the modern environment. It's wired for the ancestral savanna environment when we lived in small tribes of 50 people to 150 people. And we had to survive based on the fight or flight reflex. And that caused us to make a number of errors in the modern world because it's not based on the ancestral savanna environment. And any change in that ancestral savanna environment was dangerous. And so it helped our survival to favor the status quo. If you think about that environment, there wasn't any fundamental change. There was just the change of the seasons, spring, summer, fall, winter. And there wasn't any fundamental change in the, in the environment in which we were. In the modern environment, we have many more disruptions. We have disruptions like the pandemic, like the rise of remote work, like generative AI, earlier, the fiscal crisis of 2008, 2009, the rise of a smartphone. They fundamentally change the way we collaborate, the way we work together, but it's not intuitive for us to accept that. Our intuition pushes us to go to the past, to what we're comfortable with. Despite the modern world having many more disruptions, which comes with opportunities as well as challenges. For many leaders, it's really comfortable to manage in the office. We know how to do it. It's We have learned how to do it. It's been 20, 30, 40 years for some of us where we learned how to manage in the office. It's really comfortable to learn how to manage in a different setting. And so they're not, that's what we're used to doing. So especially more experienced leaders. It, that's what feels natural and intuitive. And it's hard to adapt to a hybrid modality. And it's hard for employees to adapt to hybrid. So they need your guidance on how to do so. Let's talk about another example. Attentional bias. So I'm going to set up something over here. Hold on. So I want you to be paying attention here to 
the people on the white passing the ball. So let's see what they do. The number of passes. The monkey business illusion. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. The correct answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. And that's the monkey business illusion. Learn more about this illusion Okay, so now we'll do a little poll, and you should be able to see the poll in the window. Which of these elements did you notice in the video? The gorilla, the gorilla and the player leaving the game, gorilla and curtain changing color, gorilla player leaving the game and curtain changing color, or none of the above? Please go ahead and vote. Five more seconds. Make your voice heard about what you saw. OK, so we see that just about a quarter saw none, uh, no none of the elements. Just over a quarter saw only the gorilla. Then. About a quarter saw the gorilla and the player leaving the game. Just under a fifth saw the gorilla and the curtain changing color. And only 5% saw everything. The gorilla, player leaving the game, and the curtain changing color. Oh, you did a little bit better than the previous group that uh, I trained in fall, so congratulations. So this has to do with attentional bias, what we pay attention to. We tend to focus on the most emotionally salient aspects of our environment. And that would be, some of us are really focused just on the numbers, We're just focusing on the counting the passes. Some will notice when there's a huge gorilla that comes onto the basketball field, if you can imagine the savannah environment was beneficial to notice these things. But it's harder to focus and notice other things, like the people leaving the game, the people becoming disengaged, for example or the curtain changing color, the background changing, the conversations, the discourse changing. The, for example, one of the things that is important about hybrid work and well-being is that there was a recent study that showed that well-educated people, college graduates, especially men, who are working at about the same rate they were working before the pandemic in terms of the percentage of people working. but they're actually working less hours per week. So they're voluntarily working less hours because they pay more attention to their well-being, to flexibility. And it's hard for people to intuitively notice these things, these changes in dynamics. And so these are other factors that may be just as important. Doing so it's helps lead to what you probably heard about, the proximity bias in hybrid work where we preferentially pay attention to in-person staff and ignore the value and contribution of those who are currently remote. 
So there was a survey from the Society for Human Resource Management that said that over 40% of managers sometimes forgot about people who are working remotely. So that's not great. This is the attentional bias. So we talked about the status quo bias, attentional bias, and the last one is called functional fixedness. Functional fixedness. It's when we learn one way of functioning, we tend to become fixed in that way of functioning. You might have heard of this as the hammer nail syndrome. When you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Well, when you learn one way of collaborating, of leading, of managing teams, that tends to be something you apply to all other contexts. And it's hard to change that. Even if the context is disrupted and old ways transform from being functional to dysfunctional. What was functional in in-office settings is not very functional within hybrid settings. So many leaders, I've seen them transpose office-centric methods of collaboration on remote work in March 2020. They didn't stop to fundamentally change how they managed people. They didn't get training on how to do so. And the same applies to employees, especially those who are less efficient in using tech tools. Questions on these three cognitive biases, on intentional bias, status quo bias, and functional fixedness. Got to have it resolved before the problem arises. So the way I'm suggesting we draft. We'll okay, I hear you. somebody unmuted themselves. So did you have a question to ask? Um, it, it's just Darren. Uh, yes, Darren, go ahead. Uh, yeah, it wasn't so much a question, but it was. Uh, I found this interesting. Uh, um, that uh, about the whole um, how our minds are wired to the savanna. Uh -huh thing and uh, how change i guess humans find it mm -hmm. uh, uh, threatening as opposed to yeah. a, an opportunity i find that's how my mind works for sure is that oh you know, this is something new oh i gotta learn this oh i gotta do things differently oh what a pain that is and don't tend to look at the like how it might make things better so mm -hmm. yeah it's a good reminder hmm. okay here darren it, it is a good reminder and it's something to just keep in the back of our heads that just because our intuition tells us something doesn't mean it's right. <laughs> it's we're wired that way. And we're wired not for the modern world, we're wired for the then environment. So often our intuition will lead us astray. And that's something to be aware of. Any other questions or comments from folks? Well, if not, let's take a break and we'll be back at the top of the hour. We'll see you at 2 p.m.
we'll start up in a minute. Okay, hopefully everyone is back. So let's go on and talk about some best practices for hybrid work. So the best approach is pretty clearly a team-led approach where team leads collaborate with team members to decide what works best for each team within some broad guidelines provided by the top leadership. Now, why is this the best approach? Well, we have a number of data points. So for example, Gallup did some surveys showing that you don't you have the highest engagement not when people make their own decisions just to let everyone make their own decisions around when they come to the office it would seem like people if they're given full autonomy they would have the highest engagement but that's not what we find you don't have the highest engagement when it's the leader of the company or just the team manager individually who sets the policy for the team or team manager who sets the policy for the team or when it's the leader of the company, the deputy minister who this makes a decision for everyone. The best approach comes for highest engagement, comes when the team together comes to a consensus-based decision around when and how to come to the office. So team leads collaborate, you as team leads collaborate with team members to achieve this goal. Why is this the case? Well, teams learn about, they need to know about, they need to learn about how they best function. They come into the office for activities that, that are best done in the office and work remotely and tasks that are best done remotely with options to come to the office for those who prefer it keeping in mind the broad-based goals of the organization and the need for cross-team collaboration. So thinking about, let's say, a team of programmers, when they come to the office, they might not need to come to the office for that much. They might, might need to come to the office at the beginning of a sprint and the end of a sprint. For accountants, they might need to come into the office for several days at the end of a month to close the books, but maybe a non or one day a week up earlier to collaborate to a limited degree. Other people who have with various other functions, you know, HR, let's say, they might have a benefit in coming into the office a little bit more frequently to collaborate with other team members. So it depends on the team, depends on what you're doing. That's why it's very important for teams to have the individual ability to determine what works best for them. So this is a team-led model. It also requires integrating best practices for hybrid work and adapting them to the needs of each team. So you want to experiment, measure, adjust, and improve over time with new techniques and technologies for hybrid work. So that's the approach that, that pretty clearly works best to get the highest engagement, morale, retention, really all the outcomes that you want. Let's talk about some specific techniques for best practices in hybrid work. 
One I want to share with you is called virtual coworking. Virtual coworking. So it's for teams that are not in the office that day, whether they're fully remote, which is not the case for a large majority of you, or hybrid, the days that they're not coming to the office. So this is for a team, six to eight people, however large, three people, however large the team is. So everyone on an individual team, so that's the team is that rank and file staff and the manager above them, get on a video conference call. Teams, Zoom, whatever you use. Turn off your microphones, leave your speakers on, and your video is optional. The goal is to work on your individual tasks. This is not a collaborative meeting. So you schedule some time to work on your individual tasks, but you work on it on a video conference call together. The crucial thing is that if anyone has questions or wants to problem solve, they can turn on their microphone to do so. And I recommend the team start with once a week for an hour, most move to once a day on the days that are not in the office because it's so helpful. This is really helpful for boosting collaboration, team bonding, and connection to company, to organizational culture. What I see is the teams, they start with you know, five, 10 minutes of silence, working on their own tasks. Then somebody has a question, they turn, they turn on their microphone, they ask a question, there's a brief five minute chat, and then teams go on back to their own work. And then another 15 minutes, maybe somebody else turns on their microphone, somebody has a question, and they have and then they answer that quickly, go on to their own work. And sometimes you might have a little brief chat about side conversations. It's especially helpful for junior staff because they get the benefit of on-the-job training and onboarding into company culture. Questions about the team-led model approach or virtual coworking? Please go ahead. You can again unmute yourself. You can put the questions into the chat, whatever you prefer. All right, no questions so far. Let's talk about another approach. Oh, I see that there's a question that just popped up. So Darren asks, processes to see what coworkers want us for us hybrid work guidelines. So we'll talk about, uh, Darren, great question. We'll talk about figuring out what coworkers want closer to the end when we talk about determining team level guidelines. So keep an eye out for that. It'll be the last part in terms of team level guidelines. That's when you get together and you have that conversation about what everyone wants. All right, so let's talk about a technique called asynchronous brainstorming. So innovation. For government workers at the provincial level, you don't necessarily have the same sort of innovation that you have for tech companies, but you have innovation in terms of coming up with new processes, new ways of addressing requests and needs of citizens, addressing their concerns in a better way. So there's definitely needs for innovation, for problem solving. And typically the approach to that has been brainstorming. Get together in a room, and just shoot ideas and have that conversation. Now that traditional methodology has some benefits and those include things like synergy. Synergy refers to where you have an idea because somebody inspired you to have an idea. So this is not like the, whatever, corporate speak synergy. This is the technical term here is from the research. It's a, when, again, you have an idea that was inspired by somebody else's idea, where you would not have had the idea if somebody else did not have their own idea that inspired you. So that's what synergy refers to in non-corporate speak. Social facilitation, that's where you're motivated by other people having ideas and sharing ideas. So social facilitation is another benefit of this traditional brainstorming. 
but it has a number of serious problems, which we knew already long before the pandemic and the rise of remote work. One is production block. That's where you have an idea, but other people are talking about a different idea. And you struggle to interrupt them and you lose train of thought and you lose tra look track of your idea. That's especially problematic for people who are junior, so reluctant to interrupt others because they don't have as much power and people who are more introverted. Another is evaluation apprehension. That's why you're worried about sharing an idea that you have because it seems too out of the box or maybe it implicitly criticizes something the team is doing or one of the team members is doing. It's a big problem for people who tend to be more pessimistic rather than optimistic, who see the world as, as who see the glass as half full rather than half empty. I'm sorry, who see, who see the glass as half empty rather than half full, who see the world as more full of threats than opportunities. And so it's a problem again for junior people because they don't have as much power. And there's social loafing. So we have extensive research showing that the more people that are in a brainstorming session, the less willing everyone is to work hard to create new ideas. And it works really poorly in remote settings. We definitely know that it does not work very well in remote settings. So in synchronous brainstorming is a technique that was developed to address these problems in Harvard already in the early 90s, and I adapted it to hybrid and remote work. So let's talk about virtual asynchronous brainstorm. First, everyone generates ideas separately from each other asynchronously, whether they're working remotely or in the office, mostly remotely, it's fine to work remotely, and you input them into a form like Google Forms, Mural, Microsoft Forms, whatever. This is great to address production blocking because you don't have to interrupt anyone. It's especially, again, helpful for junior people and it's helpful for people who are introverted. Also, you can make the input fully anonymous or visible only to the facilitator and team leader, and I did a lot of facilitation of these. So if you make it fully anonymous or visible only to the team leader, that helps address evaluation apprehension, where you're worried about being judged. Again, that's people who are pessimistic and junior people. Then after, however, the facilitators cleans up the output, everyone votes on and comments on the resulting ideas. So here, imagine you have a group of six people. Each comes up with 12 ideas. So you have 72 ideas. Then you delete, there are 12 duplicates. So you delete 12 ideas and you have a, now 60 ideas from six people. So the, everyone gets a spreadsheet with 60 ideas and they anonymously vote and comment on the resulting ideas. So you can evaluate them based on excitement, practicality, novelty, impact, other relevant categories on a scale of one to 10. One being low, 10 being high. So say, how excited are you? How practical they are? How novel they are? How impactful? Let's say you evaluate them on all four. So excitement, practicality, novelty, and impact. So now you have each idea, 60 ideas. Each one has an evaluation from one to 40. So one to 10 on each of the four categories. So that's anywhere from four to 40. And each idea is evaluated by six people. So now each idea has a score up to 240 points. Six times 40 is 240 points. So up to 240 points per idea. And you also have some comments on each idea. Then you have a meeting to select among the top ideas and decide the next step. So you can say that you'll only pay attention to the ideas. And those, by the way, were fully anonymous voting. So now you, as the facilitator, get the spreadsheets, six anonymous spreadsheets. You just use the Excel function to, or Google Forms adding function either one Excel, add function, Google Forms add, to add them up and you have now the scores for each of the 60 ideas. So you only include, let's say, ideas that had above 220 in the final discussion. And here's where you can meet. You can meet virtually, I recommend meeting in person if possible, to select among the top ideas, of all the ideas that got up 220 and above and decide on the next steps. So the rest of the ideas, fortunately, aren't lost. Typical brainstorming meeting, they're lost. Here, they go to an idea bank to use later. The outcome of peer review shows that you get many more ideas and more novel ideas when you use this technique. 
questions about asynchronous brainstorm as technique. Okay, great. So another brief technique I want to share with you about is serendipitous idea generation. This is the, how do you replace well, how people running into each other in the hallway and having conversations about problem solving, improving processes, whatever it is that you need to address. So you want to create a channel in team software or Slack or whatever, Trello, whatever you use for spontaneous ideas for each department, for each work unit, for smaller teams and departments. When anyone has an idea relevant to the team or department, you put it in the appropriate channel. Others can respond if they find the idea useful because as you know, people love to give advice. And then if responses snowball until they reach critical mass, you can do an asynchronous brainstorming. So this is replacing the running into each other in the hallway with a virtual format. Questions about this technique of serendipitous idea generation. The previous one was deliberate idea generation, virtually synchronous brainstorming. This is serendipitous idea generation. All right, no questions so far. Let's talk about some more techniques for communication. Clarity Canvas, a really good technique. So this is a centralized hub for teams shared documents. So each team has should have a hub for documents that indicate how the team functions. So this is not just the project level things they're working on. This is about team functioning. What are the team's goals? Short-term goals, medium-term goals, long-term goals. What are the roles and responsibilities of different team members? What are the policies, processes, instructions for how the team functions? What are the various projects, the timelines, the guideline, the progress in each, and larger projects? So if you have them, you should have a clarity canvas for each project. The reason this is important in hybrid work is that it's harder to coordinate in hybrid settings than it is in fully in-person settings. So this replaces a lot of the coordination, a lot of the quick checking in that you would have with other people when you're in the office about like, oh, how's this project going? What's our goal again? What, what are the roles and responsibilities? How do we do this? This probably just provides a reference for all that. That's much, much easier and simpler than trying to get a hold of each other in remote settings, which is more difficult than in-person settings. Now, I recommend that you create these documents together as a team. So get all team members together in person or virtually, Work for each element of this approach of the team clarity canvas to make sure that everyone is on the same page about everything we've talked about, the goals, the projects, roles, responsibilities, policies, processes. Do so for each project if you have larger projects. And I guarantee that you'll find and solve some communication and comprehension gaps and get much more mutual commitment and buy-in on everything you do together as a team. Questions on the clarity canvas? All right, let's talk a little bit more about communication. Establishing clear norms, clear communication collaboration norms, where you focus on effective and least costly forms of communication. This is especially important in hybrid work because it's too tempting to have too many meetings. And as we saw, people really want fewer meetings. So you want to focus on effective and least costly forms of communication. So pushing communication, think about communication within three buckets. Synchronous in an office, what's that bucket about? It's great for collaboration and clarity. Highest in collaboration, highest in clarity. You can not only get the content of what people are saying, but also their tonality, their tone of voice, and their nonverbals. 
Here, you see my nonverbals only in my face. You don't see the rest of my body and you don't see the gestures I'm making and so on. And of course, the technology makes the tone not fully 100% the same quality as it would be if we were in person. And so you have a lot of benefits of being in person where you get the full range of tone of voice and especially body language that you don't get through seeing me as a square on a Zoom screen. So this is the highest collaboration clerk. And of course, you have the before conversations, after conversations, the relationship building. But this is also the highest cost. So you want to save this method of collaboration, synchronous and in office, for more important interactions, for more important forms of collaboration. The ones where you want the highest effectiveness. Then synchronous and virtual is the next, where you don't have to take the time to commute to the office, and especially in as remote setting as the, where you are in the Northwest Territories. Synchronous and virtual, it's moderate. It's less collaborative, less clear. So this is where we are synchronous and virtual right now. It could be like this. It could be some people don't turn on their video, which you definitely want people to turn on their video in contexts where it's important to have stronger engagement because people are definitely more engaged when they turn on their video, large majority of us. And that's moderately costly. So you want to think about what kind of activities are worthwhile to ask people to have this synchronous and virtual. So this should not be something that is requires less intensity than the in-office collaboration, which requires the highest intensity. You might have that for decision-making conversations, for conveying strategy. This is fine for just regular meetings or maybe one-on-one -on -one performance evaluations. This is fine for just having regular meetings for clarification, for occasional team meetings. This is a fine form. Then asynchronous. It's the lowest collaboration, lowest form of clarity. Of course, you don't have all this nuance of body language and tonality, but it's the lowest cost. So try to push down communication to the lowest cost bucket as much as possible. That way you will be burdening people less and it will be less and less effortful for people. Let's say team update meetings. You can definitely have them in asynchronous formats and not simply relying on text. You can use audio and video messages. So record an audio message with a team update, record a video message with a team update and sell it to people with guidelines, with instructions. These are very useful to convey nonverbal cues and emotions. So again, these nonverbals, the tonality, body language, you can convey that through audio messages and video messages. The problem is of course, you don't have the synchronous response and, you know, from people but you can still convey the nuances through audio and video. I want to encourage you to experiment with practicing with audio and video and make them part of your team's communication repertoire. So questions about the three buckets and pushing down communication into the lowest possible bucket. This is really important to have less meetings and to have meetings that are going to be less in person to think about, okay, what do we actually need to accomplish? How can we accomplish it in the least costly and effortful way? Questions about this. Okay, no questions, then let's go on. Asynchronous communication. One thing you need to coordinate clearly on is the timing of response for asynchronous communication, at least acknowledgement of receipt and next, next steps. You want to get clarity for your team members on what's appropriate. I've seen a lot of managers struggle with this because their team members won't reply to them in a manner that the managers perceive as timely. And when I dig into it, I see that the manager hasn't set an expectation. There's no clarity about this. 
For example, you could say that 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. is quick response time, 30 minutes for email or Microsoft Teams messages, 15 minutes for text or voicemail, unless you're in a meeting. Otherwise, you respond by the end of day, no requirement to respond outside of working hours. This is an example from one organization I worked with that established this sort of modality. Other organizations will have different expectations, but this is the kind of thing that you want to establish. Timing of response. Another is the content of response. Some managers complain about the team members failing to respond to every point. When you send an email with five points, maybe the team member will respond to two of them. And they're like, and you're like, well, what about the other three points, right? Other managers complain of getting long messages from their team members that they don't have time to read. And this, again, is a matter of coordination. You want to coordinate with your team members on what you want to do. So get alignment about what the appropriate approach is for your team, for everyone there. Questions about the timing of response and the content of response and alignment around these. Let's see, so Bradley, I see Bradley asks about having a group meeting in a semi-social environment to allow water cooler moment. So that when people meet face-to-face, -face, they can sometimes connect the dots that would not be seen in a work from home dynamic. Yes, so in terms of team building, I definitely recommend having occasional social meetings where you can coordinate with each other, collaborate so that you get to know each other. And I don't know what the kind of reimbursement policy would be for the Department of Infrastructure, what you're allowed, what the funding is. So you want to look at that in terms of what kind of reimbursement, because sometimes if you ask people to do that, then they will wonder, well, you know, if we're getting together for coffee or we're getting together for lunch, or getting together, whatever it is, are we going to get reimbursed? So I'm not sure what the policy is. If somebody can share about some policies in the chat, that might be helpful for Bradley. But that's something I've definitely seen be something that something that rank and file employees ask about when there is when there are conversations about water cooler activities. Another alternative to things that are social is to have outings which don't require money. So for example, you can have charitable activities that you do together, volunteer activities and so on, like Habitat for Humanity Builds or various other volunteer activities that don't, where there are no expectations created around reimbursements of some sort by the organization. So you can consider those sorts of things. But uh, think about activities that would allow you to do social activities without, requ without requirements for reimbursement if you can't get reimbursement. So thinking about that is a, I know it's trickier for companies, it's much easier to get reimbursement than for government entities. I have a question. Yes, please. Um, so I do work from home um, mm -hmm. about 60% of the time. The one issue okay. I have um, regarding communication is not knowing who is in the office or who is working from home. Is there a way we could, like, what would you suggest on a daily basis? Um, just that way we know who's who's in the office, who's not. Um, it does get a little frustrating when you do send that email requesting some quick information, you don't get it, and then you start calling people and <laughs> you can't get a hold of anybody. Yeah, so this is oh, definitely an issue. And one way that I believe that you're mostly, I believe the Department of Infrastructure uses Microsoft Teams. 
And one thing that works in Microsoft Teams is in using Outlooks, you can use Outlook and use that to represent your scheduled work location, change location as needed. This is a relatively new feature, so many people don't know about it. And so here I put it into the chat for you to take a look at. But yes, you can indicate in Outlook your scheduled work location and change location as needed. Does that answer the question, Meg? Oh, is that the kind of thing that you're thinking about? Uh, kind of. I know there's some people who just don't like using Teams because to them it's like using, you know, the 2000s version of MSN Messenger. So some people tend to shy away from it. Not Teams. I mean Outlook. Um, so what what technology? I my believe. If I remember correctly, the, uh, the government of Northwest Territories in general, Department of Infrastructure, you mostly use Microsoft Teams, uh, Microsoft, right? Or, but do other people, but uh, is there widespread use of other tech besides Microsoft? Um, yeah, we use Outlook for email every day, but uh, yes. a lot of people use Teams to coordinate and right. to share so, documents. Right. So here was, uh, so that, yeah, that's that was my understanding. So that's why I was talking about specifically Outlook. So this is about Outlook. So since people are using Outlook widely, uh, this might be, since people are already using, this might be a solution. What do you think? Yeah, that could work. Thank you. Sure. No. Yes, yeah, so that's what I, what I recommend to folks who use Outlook. And again, it's not something I would recommend just standardizing across department, but within your team that's something that you could have a conversation about with your team members and say well hey can we have an approach where everyone indicates where they are at every day just at the start of the day indicate where you plan to be so that we can coordinate around this So Joe, Darren, yeah, uh, so yes, uh, Teams is the government of Northwest Territories uh, preferred channel. Yeah, that's that was my understanding. That's why I was talking about Teams, but Outlook as part of Teams because you're Microsoft chap mainly. So Joe, um, Joe, not sure how to pronounce it talks about scheduled work location. I'm expectedly out of the office. So expectedly out of the office, you can just have an away message. So for people who are unexpectedly out of the office, I recommend having away messages saying, I'm out of the office for you know, today having a situation. So that, that's uh, the usual approach that unexpectedly out of office message. Other folks, other questions and comments? All right, so talking about using tech tools, there are different ways of using tech tools. So this is just uh, very relevant to what we're just discussing. And it's important to align on how to use email versus Microsoft Teams messages versus other tools like voicemail, like texting. You want to ensure that all communication is accessible so everyone has access to communication regardless of their location. And you want to have good de detailed records of decisions, meetings, and project status as part of using tech tools. So how this is a question of coordination. If you want, do you have any questions? Does anyone have any questions on coordinating around making sure that you use tech tools in, in the same way within your team that other I've definitely heard managers complain that their team members aren't using technology tools in the same ways. 
And it's a matter of coordination and collaboration to get everyone coordinated and on the same page about how you use these tech tools. Questions about that, questions about doing so. All right, let's talk about collaboration. You want to have clear expectations for collaboration behavior. I've definitely had some problems, managers report some problems where someone comes into the office on days that they're expected to collaborate and then they put on their headphones and they work on their individual tasks. That's no good. You want to have defined collaboration behavior. For example, you can say Tuesday 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. is the time for collaboration. Come to the office and focus on collaborating with each other. Avoid putting on headphones, sitting on your desk and working. Welcome conversations and socializing. So that had to do with the, the topic of socializing. So this might be a time for socializing. This might be a time for collaboration, for meetings. This is what that time is for. And the Tuesday at 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. is just an example from one of the other provincial governments which, which I worked with which uh, there was a department there that decided on that time. So that was a way to specifically get around collaboration expectations for people in that department. So question about coordinating on collaboration. Okay, good. So team building activities. So this really is going back to the question about team building, socializing. Let's get more in depth into various forms of team building that you can do. I recommend organizing team building activities once a month to have a sense of community. And this is within a team and also more broadly across teams if you can do so. So to the extent that you have coordination, it's helpful to coordinate between teams that work together regularly to have activities between teams. In person, of course, is most impactful, but you should also consider virtual events to be more inclusive because, and they're easier to organize. So you want to discuss with team members what works best for them and vary activities according to different preferences. So Bradley, I hope that gets to the question that you raised about semi-social events, water cooler activities. So this is a more broad framework for how you would approach these activities. And again, you know, keep in mind, I already talked about this, but keep in mind about the funding for them. So you want to think about if you're going to have social activities, some of them would require funding, some of them would re not require funding. So it depends on the kind of funding that you're able to get. Good, I'm glad to hear it, Bradley. Other people, other questions about team building activities? All right. Let's talk about challenges in collaboration and learning. So we know that hybrid work does result in some major challenges. It really clearly, we have from extensive surveys, people have a stronger sense of connection to their own team, but a weaker connection to other teams. So this is a problem because if you don't have weak, strong connections to other teams, that creates internal dynamics that hinder cross-team collaboration and to weaker connection to the organizational culture as a whole, which is also not good. So this harms collaboration and especially harms learning for junior staff who would want to learn from others who are not within their teams. So best solution to this is establishing a high quality hybrid mentoring program. 
Ideally, this would be a hybrid mentoring program for the whole department within the context of a department, a program that HR owns. So hybrid mentoring program, what does that look like? You want to have two mentors for each mentee. So a mentee would be someone who is in the department for less than five years, so junior person, and you want to have two mentors for that person. One senior staff who's not the supervisor from the team of the mentee, from, again, from the mentee's own team, so a senior staff member who's not a supervisor. And one from another part of the department. So not your own team, different part of the department. So two mentors. The mentor from your own team will help the junior employee with on the job training. So answer questions about their own work. What do they need to do? Help them get into their team activities, whatever they need to, to do. So having those quick answers to questions is really very helpful for on the job training. And it's this person would help them with team bonding, getting to the team spirit, understanding the team dynamics, how people work with each other, the team's processes, systems, and so on. The mentor from the other part of the organization would help the junior employee with connections across the organization and integrating more broadly into the organizational culture and career development for understanding other parts of the organization. So that's really important. This person, their job would be to introduce the mentor from the other part of the organization. Their job is to introduce the team member, the junior team member to others across the organization, get them connected into the organizational culture and help them understand what kind of career they can develop for the organization by showing them other parts of the organization. So they need to be aware of what the other parts of the organization are like. What does the mentoring meeting look like? Both mentors meet with a mentee at least once a month for 20 to 30 minutes, and they answer questions before those meetings. And this is ideally in person, especially in the beginning when you're forming the relationship, that's especially valuable. Also do a co-working session once a week. So you remember the co-working, you get on a video conference call, turn off your microphone, speakers on, video optional, you work on your individual tasks, but if the mentee has questions, they turn on their microphone, ask for help. It's very helpful for on-the-job training and onboarding into the organizational culture. So this is not that much of an ask of a senior person. It's a couple of hours per month with answering questions. And again, during the co-working session, they can work on their own tasks. So it's not that much additional time, in other words. Now, you want to make sure that you're assessing the performance of this mentoring program. This is why HR needs to own it. You have surveys of both mentors and mentees run by HR every three months to address any problems and look for opportunities for improvement. So have a person from HR, as I mentioned, own the mentoring program. You want to provide mentors and mentees alike with resources and training on effective mentoring. And this is gonna be part of matching mentors and mentees. So if issues arise, the HR person needs to be able to coach the mentor and mentee on how to be effective in that mentoring relationship. And if needed, you'll need to reassign the mentor and mentee to other mentors and mentees. That's important. Then you want to make sure to include mentoring as part of the performance evaluation for the mentor. So not the mentee, but the performance evaluation for the mentor. You can assess and improve the learning of mentor, of the mentee, so, the learning and the improvement of the mentee as one of the SMART goals for the mentor in small-scale performance evaluations, which I'll talk about later, measured by the meeting consistently and by mentee survey responses. Questions about the mentoring program. Don't see any questions. Let's go on to implementation. What I recommend you do for
for implementing, and this goes back to one of the questions earlier for implementation, use an anonymous survey to assess team member preferences. You can consider using a synchronous brainstorming as an approach to this. Have a team discussion about the results, establish a balance that works best for most, have feedback and measure effectiveness, and make regular revisions once a quarter. So that's the approach that I recommend for implementing communication and collaboration expectations. Questions about implementation. This is, of course, for you as managers, should be one of the most important points in terms of the takeaways. How do you actually implement all the good ideas that we're talking about in this training? So this is how you implement it. Questions about implementation. Okay, don't see any questions. So let's take another, let's take the next break. Uh, it's 13 minutes to the top of the hour. So let's get back at the top of the hour at 3 p.m. I'll see you then.
We'll start in about a minute. Okay, hope everyone's back. Let's talk next about remote meetings, much like this one. So prepare your creation. Preparing for remote meetings. If possible at all, share clear agenda in advance of meetings. Provide any necessary information, materials or so on beforehand and do a tech check because last minute stuff often comes up and you need to update your Zoom browser, your Microsoft Teams browser, whatever you need to do. Last minute stuff comes up, especially if you're using unusual technology or different setup. Okay, scheduling. Consider time zone differences for scheduling. Mostly this won't be a problem for you, of course, with Northwest Territories. It's in one time zone, but sometimes you'll be meeting with people in other time zones. I recommend scheduling all meetings for either 25 minutes or 50 minutes, not 30 minutes or 60 minutes. You can get the vast majority of what you want done in 25 minutes and 50 minutes compared to 30 minutes, and 60 minutes. And you'll have time for what typically happens within the office, which is walking between meetings, taking breaks. We definitely have research showing that it's not a good idea to jump from meeting to meeting. You need a mental break in between mental break physical break, take that time. For all the times that we've been having these 12, 13 minute breaks, I've definitely been taking a physical break, mental break, so please do that. And that helps reduce what's called video conference fatigue, also called Zoom fatigue. So please make sure to shorten, schedule shorter meetings. I've, again, I've been doing this for other provincial governments in Canada, and they have the, the departments there, they have definitely found that useful. And schedule breaks during longer meetings like this one to prevent fatigue. So you should be scheduling meetings in longer meetings. You should be scheduling them every 40 to 45 minutes. It's definitely a good idea. Establish shared norms for a meeting group. And how do you use remote tools? So different people have different Perspectives on using remote tools, chat, emojis, raising hand. You want to make sure that you have clear expectations and communication on how you use these within your team, within your work unit, within your division department. Cameras, on or off, something I mentioned before. People are definitely more engaged with their cameras on, but they will also be more trained. So make a decision for cameras on. I encourage you to Tell people to have cameras on when they're speaking and when it's important to be more engaged. So decision-making meeting, conveying strategy and so on. Don't ask for videos on when someone is reporting in progress or during an educational session like this one. I'm not asking you to have your cameras on. Etiquette. Align appropriate attire. So this might be appropriate attire for what you consider appropriate for training. You might consider 
polo shirts appropriate, you might consider a jacket appropriate, whatever might be appropriate. I recommend starting each minute with several meeting with several minutes of chit chat to connect on a personal level, build relationships. That's very helpful. Of course, I hopefully everyone knows that by now, but do encourage people to mute when they're not speaking. That's very valuable. And make visual contact when speaking. So right now, if you look at me, I'm making visual contact with you. I'm making visual contact with you. Now I'm looking at all the squares on the screen where you're located on my screen. So I can see the squares on the screen, but I can't see, but you can't see my eyes. Okay, now I'm, you can see my eyes again. I'm making visual contact at you, with you. I'm looking at you. This is what it feels like. But I'm not looking at the screen where all of you are located. I'm looking at my camera, which is above the screen. And now I'm looking at the screen where everyone's located. So this is the difference. You really want to make visual contact when you're speaking. Look at the camera, not at the screen. Manage interruptions, especially of women and less experienced staff. So women and less experienced staff tend to be interrupted more often by males and senior staff. And this is a problem. This causes challenges for women, for less experienced staff. You as a manager need to manage and address these interruptions. This is definitely an issue that, need, that you need to be paying attention to. Encourage participation from all attendees. Check with them on how they're doing. Give them time, like I give you time to stop ask for questions, ask for contributions. Collaboration tools, meeting summaries. Use tools that allow real-time editing and interaction. For example, I used polling. Used interactive features like polls. You can use Microsoft Teams, SharePoint, and so on that people can edit at the same time to engage participants to get instant and anonymous feedback. Use a meeting summary. Send it out promptly, including key decisions and action items. AI tools can be a good tool to get meeting summaries and get those quick summaries and action items distributed to everyone. How do you implement this? Again, feedback and improvement. You want to survey meeting participants as you're implementing the changes based on these best practices. Measure and improve how you're doing with your meetings over time. Check in every quarter on improvements especially as you're integrating these new techniques and new technology. Implementation will definitely require some training for your team members and getting over the awkwardness as you practice new habits, like new approaches to emojis, raising hand, using chat, and so on. But it's very much worth it in the long run. Questions on implementing these techniques? Remote meetings are definitely important, so I encourage you to ask questions if you have any. All right, if not, let's talk about hybrid meetings. So hybrid meetings, you'll want to address the intuition, our intuition to have proximity bias. We'll just tend to favor in-person attendees. That's our intuition. That's how we feel. It's just kind of inevitable. Uh, okay, Darren Campbell asks, thoughts on how to get feedback and encourage it from coworkers. So Darren, the key for feedback from coworkers would be to use the inbuilt tools. So Microsoft, for example, has polls. You can easily use polling to get feedback and encouragement uh, to and encourage doing so. So use polling during the meeting. So you've seen me use polling just like that. You'll want to do that. See how people are doing, how the meeting is going. People will be fine, happy to click on an answer on a poll during the meeting. You can use also Microsoft Forms to form more in-depth feedback during the meeting. So at the end of a meeting, give everyone five minutes to, to fill out Microsoft Forms and then have a discussion about what everyone filled out, their feedback. So this is definitely a good technique. Have them fill it out right there during the meeting time and then have a discussion about it. So that's what I would encourage. Hope that helps. 
the key is to allow people to fill, to fill things out anonymously and do it relatively easily. That's polls that allow that. And Microsoft Forms allows people to take the time during the meeting, just like you would uh, during the asynchronous brainstorming, you take the time during the meeting to fill it out and then have a discussion. Okay, hybrid meetings. Again, addressing the intuition around proximity bias. Don't treat, make sure that remote attendees aren't treated as second class citizens and balance in-person facilitation, focusing on in-person and people who are remote. It's gonna be similar to remote meetings and preparation and scheduling, so I won't go over that. Let's talk about interactions. Encourage remote attendees to dial in early and engage with people who are in person. So that will be inevitable in-person pre-meeting chit chat, encourage people who are remote to dial in and engage in that chit chat. Have both remote and in-person attendees use remote tools like polls, like emojis and so on. Discourage site conversations between in-person attendees. This can be difficult. <laughs> I know, but you want to discourage side conversations. You want to focus on people engaging with each other. So collaboration tools, in addition to points relevant to the meetings, if you have in-person collaboration tools like whiteboards or flip charts, at least have a camera pointing to this tool. For larger meetings, consider having a separate facilitator for remote attendees. So if you have a meeting over 20 people, you want to make sure to, that there's someone who separately facilitates remote attendees. And that will help ensure that remote attendees are able to participate fully, help manage technical issues, gather their feedback, interrupt on their behalf. And you want to have similar meeting summary improvement and training as remote meetings. Questions about hybrid meetings. Okay, doesn't seem like there are any questions. Great. Let's go on to performance management. It's definitely a very important area of hybrid work. How do you manage people's performance? We saw from the studies, the peer review trials, and this is a huge, huge issue. Performance management, that managers don't have a good way of managing performance or evaluating performance. So the broad framework here is a combination of trust and a company to accountability. You need to understand that people want to feel trusted. And of course you want to feel trusted. So you want to make sure that you convey to people that you trust them while providing them with accountability for both individual tasks and collaborative tasks. We talked about how collaborative tasks tend to get lost in terms of performance management and evaluation. So you want to evaluate both individual tasks and collaborative tasks. Include, of course, if there are organizational goals, identified by the leadership to make sure that organizational goals are part of the evaluation. Now, the key is going to be transitioning from simply having a once annual performance evaluation to complementing that with frequent small scale performance evaluations. If you don't wanna use performance evaluation, you can use the term performance check-in, but it has to be an assessment of their performance, how they're doing as tied to the broader goals of the team. So weekly, bi-monthly, every, once every two weeks, one, or twice a month, or monthly one-on-ones, this is what you want to be thinking about. One-on-ones where you evaluate people's performance. Best to do in person, if at all possible, because sometimes you'll get into issues that need to be managed with full tone and body language. The frequency depends on what works best for each person. For different team members and roles, it will be different. So you want to discuss with each team member what fits their individual needs. For example, for junior team members, more often will be better. So that's weekly, monthly, or by monthly one-on-ones. What do you do? What's the point of these one-on-ones? So 
prior to the one-on-one, -on -one, you decide on three to five goals until the next one-on-one. -on -one. The three to five goals should be tied to your broader team goals, your broader team performance goals. What are the team's goals? And tying the team's goals to the work of each individual team member. You as a manager should be able, of course, to do that. Tie the goals that the team has to three to five smaller sub goals that a team manager, that a team member would have over the course of a week or two weeks or a month. 24 hours before the upcoming one, one the team member sends their supervisor, you, a report. Um, what they accomplished of the three to five goals, what problems they solved, and a self-evaluation. Whatever the scale you, that you tend to use, zero to four or whatnot. During the one-on-one, -on -one, you as a supervisor, you affirm or revise their evaluation. You coach them on problem solving and whatever problems they had to solve them better. You determine any areas that are needed for them to improve. And together, you set the goals for the next one-on-one. -on -one. Now, this evaluation is fed into a continuous evaluation spreadsheet, which the manager edits, you as the manager would edit it, and the team member can always see it. And so they know what they need to work on. So the manager would use this to evaluate potential opportunities for promotion. Now, the benefits of this approach, of this one-on-one, -on -one. it helps team members always know where they stand and have psychological safety. So the ability to take risks, to make decisions, and to know what they need to work on, areas that they can improve. It's definitely helpful for retention and career growth. It helps build the relationship between the manager and their team members, which has been shown to be key for employee retention and engagement, a sense of connection to organizational culture, so both of those are going to be really important. Now, in terms of feedback, you want to get feedback from team members on how the performance management is going, review and improve the process every quarter. Questions about the one-on-one -on -one hybrid performance management approach, this small scale frequent performance evaluation. Okay, don't see any questions. Let's move on. Let's talk about hybrid coaching. So what's hybrid coaching? This is coaching where you as a supervisor coach people who are junior. So we talked about mentoring. This is different. Mentoring is peer to peer, even if it's a senior peer. So peer level, rank and file staff, rank and file staff. This is about a supervisor level coaching. So the coaching by a manager of a junior team member. Supervisory relationship. It's different from mentoring, which involves, which again, like I said, non-supervisory relationship. The remote coaching is going to be more complex than in-person coaching by being less spontaneous, but it does take less time and energy to do so. However, it takes planning. So set up a weekly or bi-monthly session, once a week, once every or twice a month, separate from performance management. So this is supposed to be a separate activity from performance management. Also, of course, look for opportunities to do quick meetings as questions from a coach you come up, or you notice a situation code link for coaching feedback. So you want to be aware that remote sessions can feel less engaging or personal for coaching, so address this by having clear agendas and expectations, both for in-person and remote coaching sessions. So have clear agenda, clear expectation of what it's going to be about. Save less sensitive topics for remote sessions because of course it's going to be a topic that's going to be more emotional. You want to have the full nuance, full body language, and that's better for in-person. 
and nonverbal cues are going to be lost. That leads to misunderstanding, misinterpretations. That's not good for coaching. So please try not to do that. Focus on over-communicating and echoing and have the coach you take notes and send the write-up to you as the coach afterward so that they are responsible for the note-taking. Make sure to personalize the coaching to the coachee. At the end of every session, get feedback on how the session went, what could be improved. And most coaches won't share how things can be improved unless they're directly asked. Questions about coaching in the remote and hybrid settings. Okay, let's talk about facilitating cross-departmental coordination and collaboration. So this is teams, different teams across the working across the department, different work units. How do you coordinate and collaborate across different teams within the department? You want to have a clear map of your team's relationship with other teams. So you as a manager, how do you collaborate with other teams? Whether you whether you're supporting other teams within your department or however you collaborate, think about your team's relationship with other teams. Use a mind map or simply a shared document that you can use to map out the relationship. Coordinate with the leader of the other team. So start with each leader. You want to independently write out what you need from each other. Then you want to schedule a meeting to determine how best to get these needs met from each other. Look for ways to get them met in minimally effortful ways. So less effort, less work to get your needs met from each other. Remember the free communication buckets. Highest cost, synchronous in an office, then synchronous and virtual, asynchronous is lowest cost, and you can have several things within asynchronous. Try to push costs down while making sure that it's effective for meeting the goals. Determine measures of how you address each other's needs. For example, I've something I've worked with in, in other departments in Canadian provinces is having surveys of how well each team is doing in this area, filled out by members of the other team. Treat your initial plan as an experiment for a quarter and have another meeting at the end of the quarter. Compare notes on survey results and revise as needed. Questions on facilitating cross-departmental coordination and collaboration. Okay, no questions? Great. Let's go on to formulating team level guidelines. So team level guidelines, what is that about? Also called team level agreements. This is where you bring it all together, everything that we've talked about so far. This will form the basis for your team's approach to hybrid work and include the organizational goals for hybrid work, so which provide the broad outline for your specific team guidelines. So remember, the, going back to the very beginning when I talked about the team level approach, this is where you bring it all together and you get agreement and consensus from your team on how you'll work together in a hybrid context. Make sure your team members know the organizational goals as you're determining the team level goals and get their input from your team members on how your team can best meet whatever organizational goals there are for the department for the government of Northwest Territories, and of course, and for the Department of Infrastructure. Determine what you'll experiment with during this quarter and figure out metrics to measure the success. What will you use to measure the success of how your team collaborates? Get 
input from all of your team members. Have their wishes, needs, and concerns. Make sure to try to address them and have a compromise approach. Of course, not everyone will get everything they need met. And you want to keep in mind the needs of other stakeholders, your other citizens, other departments, the organization as a whole. The discussion with your team members is aimed at getting mutual commitment and buy-in. Consensus as much as possible, but the key is getting mutual commitment and buy-in because no, nobody will necessarily get everything that they want, but team members should feel that the outcome is fair and reasonable, even if they don't get all they want. Use the team level guidelines template, which I'll send you. Fill it out and have everyone, everyone on your team sign. Share the guideline with your team in HR and save it in a shared folder. And then set up and monitor metrics, revise as needed before the end of the quarter. Now, let me share with you what the team level guideline is going to look like. And again, I'll send it to you. So this is a team level guidelines template. It's for teams to create and document team level guidelines. This is a, just a preamble. Guideline is flexible, share with all team members, revise it at least every six months. I recommend ideally once a quarter. If you have questions, you can email me. So you can have Remember what activities are most effectively done in the office, synchronous collaboration, nuanced conversations, team bonding and socializing, mentoring and training learning, and other things that are individual work is best done at home, asynchronous communication. So think about what are the team level goals. So this is a template from one organization which shows learning, retention, recruitment, well-being, and innovation as team level goals. And so here you want to think about values. What value do you work, what do you value in your working environment as a team? So you value a working environment that, for example, allows everyone to participate fully, encourages continuous feedback, prioritizes and honors focus time. How do we collaborate? You have collaboration hours, team members to be available for in sync, work between 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Monday through Thursday. Dedicated focus time, we'll prioritize and dedicate two hours focus time blocks from 3 p.m. to 3, 5 p.m., default notifications off during non-core collaboration hours, and so on. Time for asynchronous communication, headphones on, the office don't disturb. What about communication expectations? So one dials in, all dial in from their laptops in the meeting to make sure that everyone's in a playing field, agendas 24 hours in advance, and so on. How do you use email? How do you use Microsoft Teams? How do you hold each other accountable? Clearly define work and deliver liberal requirements from the beginning, including a primary owner, small scale, weekly performance evaluations. How do you collaborate? Commit to celebrating each other's successes, consider the needs of other teams across the organization, checking in. How do you do so? Create a quarterly poll to get anonymous feedback, use voice of the customer to evaluate and improve our team level guidelines. Evaluate the metrics for this method, learning, for example, retention, recruitment, well-being, innovation. These are the organizational level goals which the team meets. What about measuring the success of the current approach to hybrid work? Example is number of typical social interactions, our ability to collaborate effectively as measured by survey responses to other teams. Now, before I take questions, I'm gonna share with you a couple of stories from people who implemented team level approaches. So before taking questions on the team level guidelines. So this is Susan Winchester. She's the chief human resource officer at Applied Materials, which is a Fortune 200 high-tech manufacturer in the semiconductor space. And she'll share with you about applying these methodologies to her own context. Hi, I'm Susan Winchester, and it's my delight and pleasure to tell you a little bit about our experience with Dr. Gleb. He had a big positive impact at Applied Materials. 
Our leaders and engineers love data-based, research-based insights, which is exactly what he brings. He hit it out of the park. And he used a team-led process, which was incredibly engaging. He introduced us to a concept he created called asynchronous brainstorming. It was a process that we used with hundreds and hundreds of leaders globally at the same time. We did this during our CEO kickoff session for our strategy work. And in a very short amount of time, we were able to get great benefits. I also love the work he's doing to educate leaders around the power and positive benefits of hybrid and virtual working. And one of his techniques that I'm planning to use, because I think it's so cool, is what he calls virtual co-working where you and as many work co-workers, colleagues as you'd like, create a virtual meeting and no purpose or agenda, but rather just to be working with one another. So I highly endorse Dr. Gleb's work, love him. So that's Susan. And let me share with you another story from a different context, more government context. So this is Craig Knobloch. He is the executive director of the Information Sciences Institute of the University of Southern California, which is a 300-ish institute for with its government organization, of course, educational government organization. And it's for information science in artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, and so on. So he'll tell you about adopting team-level guidelines and a team-level approach more broadly. Okay, let's see what Craig has to say. Uh, Gleb Zabersky came came to my attention sometime back during the pandemic when uh, I was planning to have our research institute uh, follow the standard path that all the big corporations are following. So Apple and Google were announcing plans to have people come back three days a week. So I thought that seems like a good plan. So we actually sent out a message said, okay, starting this date, everyone's coming back three days a week, uh, and then, you know, can work from home two days a week. Uh, and and then I saw a video that Gleb actually, a uh, video talk that Gleb actually gave for IEEE uh, that really actually changed my mind about this. And it was a video about hybrid work and how important it was to actually embrace it. And, uh, uh, and one of the things I was impressed in the video is that all these interesting ideas about how to make hybrid work more effective and stuff. So I signed up for a meeting with Gleb and uh, uh, learned quite a bit more about you know, how to do hybrid work well. And so Gleb has come on as a consultant for the Information Science Institute and has been really helpful in terms of putting us much more in a leadership position in terms of figuring out how to do hybrid work. So we changed our policies. We are much more flexible about who can work at home and, and allowing people to work from home, you know, whatever makes sense with respect to their supervisor, uh, creating spaces in people's home offices, uh, figuring out how to onboard people in a way that, you know, when people haven't met in person, that is more effective. Uh, so I think he's been incredibly helpful in terms of really transitioning us to be a, sort of a lead in, in how we manage hybrid work at the, at the Institute. So it's been incredibly useful with all of Gleb's advice, and I appreciate all the help he's given us with respect to moving forward with this, our hybrid work plans. Okay, so questions about team level guidelines. Happy to take any questions at this stage. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Darren, go ahead. Um, yeah, I, um, this is, uh, isn't a, uh, I guess it's a question, but it might, I don't think it really fits into this uh, section, but uh, maybe something to keep in mind. It just came popped in my head as I was listening to the, the two presentations that uh, the videos that you gave. But uh, um, like the GNWT has its, its own kind of work from home policy that it's developed um, for hybrid work policy. But I think a lot of the complaints from GNWT employees is that the while we have a policy, it's not really encouraged uh, mm -hmm. for you know, 
uh, hybrid work environment and maybe even in some people cases is discouraged mm -hmm. so maybe just something to think about uh, on how we here in the gmwt i i kind of I, I i agree with those kind of views that i hear from other employees that it's it's not really encouraged and maybe a little bit discouraged and just Hmm. Some thoughts about how um, if this isn't going away it's and, and more and more people are looking for a hybrid work environment, mm -hmm. particularly the the younger employees that we're going to continue to get. Um, like how do you yeah how do you how do you make that work when maybe institutionally we're not embracing it like maybe we need to? Mm. Yeah, this is definitely an important question. We are. There's no question that hybrid work is here to stay. There's, it, it's very clear that more and more firms of various sorts are adapting hybrid work. So let me share with you some recent findings. So this is the Center for Policy Research. So um, just so that you see this, this is, mm, very re recent research a couple of months ago by a number of very prominent scholars. And what they did is that they, again, this is UK, but it's going to be very similar for Canada. What they found is that they used firm level data from the UK to study expectations about work from home. So managers forecast levels of remote work within their own firms in 2028 that are almost identical to levels in 2023. So it's going to definitely stay within firms. But the key here is that aggregate working from home is very likely to increase because younger firms, which are growing more quickly, are more likely to make more use of remote work. So in other words, that and also firm accounts that show that firms with higher levels of working from home have higher productivity and lower wage growth. And both higher productivity and lower wage growth is good for a profit. So basically, younger firms and those who work from home are more profitable and they're growing more quickly. And so more and more employees will be working at companies that have more and more remote work. And so the options for people from outside, for your employees uh, at uh, GNWT is going to be have more and more remote work over the next several years. And so no question that GNWT, if it wants to compete on retention, will need to offer remote work. Yes. So that's absolutely the case. Okay. Yeah, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Other folks, any other questions? Yes, Zior. Please go ahead, unmute yourself or uh, type your question to the chat. Oh, you yeah, unmuted yourself, go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, it is, it is a nice presentation and, um, and definitely uh, from your presentation and research, we saw that one, the hybrid work environment is getting popular day by day, mm -hmm. and 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 definitely, uh, as a kind of as you were talking about the GNWT, I'm coming back to uh, Darren's question back again. So the GNWT, you know, that one there are kind of different division. Like some of the division can be easily accommodate the hybrid work, mm -hmm. but some of the, the division like construction supervision like mm -hmm. uh, kind of um, if i go go globally like kind of production industry like hospital and then old home facilities child care and then all all those area yeah and definitely that need in person mm -hmm. so of some course. of the uh, kind of you could kind of thinking about the global perspective of gnwt some can be accommodated hybrid and some mm -hmm. cannot and as we were talking about the retention that yes that those industry or firm accommodating hybrid work or remote work then mm -hmm. they are getting less challenge for the retention on the other yes. hand so those area 
where we need that in-person worker. Mm -hmm. And definitely they are getting challenged maybe for the in terms of the retention. Absolutely. So, and, and then how we can balance these things, like definitely mm -hmm. uh, maybe another one that in-person work has more challenge, like they have to commit to the work. They have sure. to maybe uh, the pay the additional parking, maybe mm -hmm. pay their childcare facilities. So mm -hmm. is there thought or is there research going on that kind of maybe uh, in terms of the salary wages or mm -hmm. whatever the kind of how to balance, how to kind of uh, face uh, these challenges where we need kind of in-person worker. Absolutely. And so let me get back to uh, well, the research I was just showing that came out two months ago. Firms with higher levels of working from home have both higher productivity and lower wage growth. In other words, firms meaning lower wage growth, meaning that when people are having wage increases, they're lower wage increases. That means that firms that have more people working in the office, and of course, like you pointed out, zero, there are going to be some people in the infrastructure depart department of infrastructure, which will have to work from the office. What I recommend is a combination of higher wage increases. So I'm not saying cut the wages of people who are working from home more, but have higher wage increases for people who have jobs that require them to work from the office and also pay for commuting benefits. Benefits like, well, people need to fuel up their car and pay paying for their lunch when they're coming to the office, those sorts of commuting benefit requirements. We've definitely seen that improve the retention of people who are asked to come to the office and it's only fair in terms of their higher costs, right? So yes, definitely would recommend that. And this is a best practice and this is what other organizations are doing. Okay, thank you. And my next question is that, I, yes. you know that one, uh, you give few data like kind of, um, uh, programming industry, call center, and then software engineering industry. So mm -hmm. it's getting popular for the remote working. So is there any research happen in kind of like production industry, uh, like in a hospital, childcare, old home, all those kind of where in, in person, uh, people are working in in person. Is there any research or study what the people liking there? No, oh, yes, there is. So let me see if I can pull it up. Give me a couple of minutes. So you should be able to see my screen. 
So this is an examination of Fortune 500 firms office requirements by industry. So we see that tech has the highest office, uh, has the lowest office requirements. So in terms of offering work location flexibility, it has only 6% of tech companies require full-time in the office. Next is consumer goods. Next is financial services and insurance. Next is healthcare and bio, then retail and apparel, then energy, and then other. So this is, I hope, answers the question about the various industries. So we definitely know that industries, so other construction would be in the other. So of construction companies, there are going to be a number that offer flexibility in terms of people who can't have flexibility, back-end jobs and so on, back office jobs. But it's going to be quite a bit less than, let's say, tech offers or financial services and insurance. Okay, other questions? Oh, this one might be also helpful if um, for manufacturing and logistics. So uh, this is a different report in terms of flexibility, but it's 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 a more fine grained breakdown. So it shows that the least flexible industries, the least flexible is going to be manufacturing manufacturing and logistics. And it will have, I'm sorry, the least flexible is going to be restaurant and food services. So this is showing the percentage of companies that are full-time in the office. Restaurant and food service, 70%. Hospitality, 56%. Education, 54%. Retail and apparel, 49%. And manufacturing and logistics, 48%. So manufacturing logistics, I think that was one of the questions. It's going to be about half of the companies are full-time in the office. Okay, other questions? Oh, you guys asked a lot less questions in the previous group. That's fine. So let's recap the topics we covered. Talked about data and hybrid work, typical judgment errors involved in hybrid work, virtual co-working, virtual brainstorming, developing communication collaboration norms and expectations, effective remote meetings, hybrid meetings, hybrid performance management, hybrid coaching, mentoring, facilitating cross-departmental collaboration, and formulating team-level guidelines. So these are the topics we covered. At this stage, I'm happy to take questions on any aspects of any of the topics that we covered. Please go ahead. Okay, so I see no questions. Then let's take, uh, I see, let's do the 10 minute, now let's do the 15 minute break. So we'll be back at 4.05 and then we'll get into 
breakout rooms and we'll have a dis you'll have discussions with each other about integrating these techniques. So please go ahead. We'll take a 15 minute break. We'll be back at 4.05 and I will see you then.
We'll start up in about a minute. All right, everyone. Well, everyone's back. So are there any questions for me? Uh, I want to see if there are any questions before we get into breakout rooms. OK, so what we'll do next is we'll get into breakout rooms. And what you'll do in the breakout rooms is we'll have 25 minutes of discussion about how you would apply all the research, all the techniques, everything we've talked about, starting from the data to all the virtual co-working, expectations, remote work, hybrid work, team level guidelines, and so on, to your work. The government of Northwest Territories, GNWT, and of course, the Department of Infrastructure, and your own teams, your own management, Talk about that, discuss it, think about it. What I want you to do at the start of the discussion is to have one, choose one person who will be taking notes and facilitating the discussion. So just choose one person, your own manager, so you know how to choose one person. Choose one person who will be taking notes. Whoever will be taking notes, please make sure to note which room you're in. And then I'll ask each person to share their insights from their room after we finish the discussion. All right. Are there any questions about what we'll be doing? OK. So again, start by choosing a person, then have the discussion. Make sure to come off mute, and I recommend that you turn on your camera once you'll be having a discussion. I'm opening the rooms now, so please go ahead, join the rooms.
All right, everyone. Welcome back. Great. Okay, so please mute yourself if you are currently not muted. Thank you. Great. And now I'll ask the person who was the note taker and facilitator for room one to unmute themselves and share about their insights. All right, that would be us. <laughs> Great. Um, so we actually had a, I thought it was a very good discussion. Um, the one thing that was highlighted good. was definitely looking at who, because when you do work from home with the government, you have to put in an application. So mm -hmm. it's very much a case by case basis yeah. and infrastructure, Half the time you're in the office, depending on your profession, sometimes you're out in the field, sometimes you're always out in the field. Yeah. Um, so we did have someone highlight that there is an issue um, because people have been approved to work from home, but they have to be out in the field, especially during the summer. Mm -hmm. And um, there is, I'm not too sure the whole situation, but it sounds like there's no flexibility for that oh. employee, which creates a lot of issues and headaches with staffing sure um i do work out in the field um mm -hmm. but i also work from home but i've made sure to make myself mm -hmm. flexible mm -hmm. so if i have to come for an in-person meeting i don't question it <laughs> mm -hmm. um if i have to go out on the road again i don't question it we just do what we need to do and for mm -hmm. that reason um there hasn't been any concern from my supervisor or director regarding my work, which is a huge benefit for everybody. Um, sure. We also discussed uh, the mental health and mm -hmm. how working from home can be a huge, uh, definitely helps with less sick days, more productivity, yeah. um, working in the office, especially in a cubicle environment can be a bit of a nightmare. <laughs> Because sure. everybody likes to chit chat or they'll hear you mm -hmm. say one thing and they'll kind of intervene. So that was something we discussed. Mm -hmm. um, we also talked about like the safety for some people, cost savings. Um, but you don't get that water cooler conversation. Um, you do tend to be forgotten during decisions that are made on the floor, uh, which can be a bit of a problem. Mm -hmm. Um Someone did mention, though, that what they do with their group, because they're actually across the territory, is mm -hmm. twice a week they have a one hour and then a one and a half hour session where they have a Teams meeting open and everybody is muted. But during mm -hmm. that time is an opportunity for anyone to just come in, ask a question, get clarification. Oh. Great. Which That's I thought. That's the commercial co-working thing. That's the yeah. commercial co-working. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which I thought was perfect. Because. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't ever thought of that. And then mm -hmm. someone also mentioned about doing a group chat mm -hmm. um, again with people who are on shift work, which is wonderful. So everyone gets an opportunity. If there's a message that needs to be passed along, everyone gets the same message. Good. Excellent. Yeah. So I think that was pretty much the highlights. <laughs> okay. Thank you for sharing the highlights. Excellent work, Meg. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, for the first point in terms of the inflexibility, what I do tend to find is that having a team level guidelines conversation and getting alignment around this is very helpful. That way, if you are a manager and you're worried about, well, what kind of flexibility will you have if my team members are going to be working remotely or in a hybrid modality, then you can have a discussion where you agree on, okay, we'll formally have this sort of structure but of course flexibility will be needed and i want to make sure that you will be flexible if i approve this structure and so that uh like meg was saying that she herself is offering the flexibility to her supervisor saying that well when needed i'll be flexible and so having that team level guidelines discussion is very helpful to get on the same page about the needs for flexibility within the structure of formal bureaucracy that is necessary to run a department. Okay, thank you, Meg. 
Uh, let's go on to group two. Yes, hi, it's uh, Darren. Uh, hi, Darren. I was, I was uh, you know, doing note taking for um, mm -hmm. breakout group two, and um, I guess a couple of the highlights were. Mm -hmm. uh, was, Meg had yeah. mentioned it as well as far as the, the GNWT application process yeah. uh, for remote work right now. Uh, we do have one. Uh, uh, we talked about um, a form, the form that we have for this where you apply for it and that it, uh, what's in the form now is, is pretty bare bones. Uh, it's mm -hmm. not very comprehensive and uh, so there was talk about how the first, one of the first things into potentially instituting or um, um, well, not instituted because we, we we are able to do it. There is an application process, but that the, the forums would need to be. I think we need to. Uh, we worked on to address. Uh, it's not very comprehensive. We need to work on it uh, within in the, to uh, to address some of the things that we discussed in, in, throughout this workshop. Um, that makes sense. Far, like guidelines and uh, and you know uh, communication norms. Um, Right now, the form pretty much says, uh, "Can you work? Can you not work? Uh, hmm. Have you got the required equipment to do so? Um, is it safe to work there?" Um, and, but not again, not very comprehensive. Could be more detailed. It could be address more of the things to make for like a more of a comprehensive and um, and uh, more maybe perhaps more satisfying hybrid hmm. work environment for the employee and the and the managers. The sounds, uh, sounds like a really practical insight from this training to use it to inform the form changes in the format. Good, I'm glad to hear it. Please go ahead. Um, again, a second highlight was just that uh, with within the Department of Infrastructure, um, different people in our groups, uh, there is a bit of a is just how to incorporate this um, mm -hmm. hybrid work if you get requests within infrastructure because some divisions. There's a more of a need to be in the office or out in the field mm. uh, than than others, and the whole question was revised. Well, how what what would we have to do across the whole department to to put this in place and make it work for everybody? Uh, where in some cases, again, maybe hybrid work is not as easy to incorporate, or mm -hmm. even would work as well for some divisions as opposed to others, and with government policies, you tend to be a one size fits all approach. To, uh, yeah. Everybody has to be treated the same, but maybe that's maybe there needs to be some flex. There have to be some flexibility, mm -hmm. perhaps, in the division and, and how we put it together and, and an understanding of, of that uh, amongst employees and and managers. Um, and I guess the, the perhaps of kind of the third highlight was from this is. And part of our work group, we actually have somebody who works remotely now, uh, completely, okay. and, and that person talked about how uh, they have a weekly, I think it was weekly, or, or every two weeks, they have a Teams meeting with the, the various colleagues uh, for to collaborate, and it seems to work really well to use Teams to do nice. that, um, and, and so the, there is certainly some people who have uh, who are well versed in the remote work, hybrid work uh, <laughs> environment, and and, and, it's, and it's it's working for them. But but yeah, um, I just I guess the final. Yeah, I'm trying to think of an, another highlight. But I think uh, there was I think some discussion also just on perhaps there's uh, some confusion between people in the GNWT about what remote work is and what hybrid work is. What, and and that maybe there needs to be more awareness on on that as well. Mm. But uh, but yeah, those those were the uh, three highlights that uh, that we noted from our breakout. Um, but good discussion. Excellent. Good. I'm glad to hear it. Sounds like a very good discussion and uh, some practical takeaways. I'm glad that there was someone who had with some experience with remote work who can share that. Thank you, Darren. Excellent. You're welcome. All right, group three. Please go ahead. I think we were group four. Okay. Oh, anyone from group three? I'll speak. Uh, Go ahead. 
Uh, we didn't really choose anybody. We ended up getting cut off, but uh, maybe oh. so it's uh, Claudio Ardil is here and stuff and all that. Um, I, uh, we, we, we sent the messages to kind of try to get a list of uh, what you have posted here on, on the screen and stuff and all that. But uh, anyways, the discussion that we ended up having is just, uh, um, um, I think just uh, in a couple of our, um, a couple of our, uh, I guess, uh, the four people that we had in our group and stuff and all that, we end up working with mm-hmm. perhaps some contractors that, and either, and, and either maybe some staff that maybe are not so familiar, perhaps using teams and, and all of that, or uh, huh. so uh, so just having, you know, just having those challenges, like, I mean, particular mm. in our in, in, in our division alone, I mean, as much as I use it, I mean, definitely a lot of colleagues do and in, in different divisions uh, of infrastructure, uh, that you know that uh, either we may be clients, uh, I guess, to them and all that. I mean, uh, I mean, we we do use it, but uh, I mean, in particular with our staff, uh, as much as we try to use it, not everybody does, and part, and it's because they may be traveling through small communities and they may not have mm. uh, the that communication. Uh, I guess uh, uh, if you want to, um, I guess I don't know, just the the communication. Um, as, uh, not not aspect, but the uh, uh, just where they find that the communication is reliable enough in that in some cases. So uh, interesting. But okay. um, but, uh, but anyways, um, uh, yeah. I mean, we don't. Uh, uh, I mean, they they. I mean, they work remotely when they are on the road, but uh, but it's not hybrid working from home. Um, and uh, obviously. Uh, you know, put in an application and to do that and all that. I mean, I'm, uh, not to say that we it wouldn't be, uh, I mean, I would have to look at the situation and see if it would be possible or not because a lot of it is hands-on. We have to be, you know, hands-on and, and traveling and stuff and all that. Uh, but, uh, um, uh, you know, we have an employer that does accommodate uh, all that, and, uh, and, and which is great. And uh, But in some cases it does work, in some cases it doesn't, but it is obviously working with this platform. So, um Mm-hmm. That's all I can say. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for sharing that. And uh, it's definitely going to be some parallels for people who are traveling, but they're working remotely, essentially, in the context of Northwest Territories, which is definitely remote and big. So thank you for sharing that. Okay, Merle, over to you. Okay. Yes. Uh... Our group had a good uh, chat. Uh, we're kind mm-hmm. of from all different regions. Uh, we got uh, a fellow out of Yellowknife. He's got a remote gentleman working in Hay River. I've got a gentleman uh, from Inuvik working in Edmonton. He's receiving some medical treatment for the last year. Uh, someone's got someone in Fort Res and Fort Providence. I've got like four uh, settlement maintainers working remotely. I don't know if you really call that uh, working remotely. Uh, they're working by themselves and checking in every day. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> close enough. Um, we asked anybody if uh, of our group of five, if anybody wanted to work from home, and there was only one person who had said they would benefit from working from home, mm-hmm. you know, two or three days a week. Um, there was a discussion about the salary um um, uh, we got folks, do they get the benefit from working down south with, uh, there was a concern if they were receiving northern benefits. I don't know if that ever has come up, uh, Gleeb, uh, thoughts on that? If they're working, say, in Inuvik, but <laughs> uh, like for my incidents, uh, I, I don't even know this question. Um, is, are they obtaining northern benefits, or does HR address that issue? I think HR addresses that issue. So, yeah, not, not my area of expertise. But, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, that's an, not not an issue then. Mm-hmm. Um, majority of us agree that if there was a request or you know individual request, look at a case by case basis. There is support mm-hmm. for that. Um, but uh, they do, do. There was a there seemed to be a requirement to if you're gonna work from home, you gotta work in the north. You can't be sitting in uh Maui uh on the beach uh checking sure, of course. every day. 
Yep. And, uh, you know, there was support for someone, some folks who had m mobility issues for sure. Mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, if that's an option, uh, certainly we'll support that. Um, again, there's case by case policy and where you follow the guide. And I think everybody is pretty supportive of uh, this uh, option if it's out there to GNWT employees. It, I don't think it's been addressed by uh, the union um, that I'm aware. Hmm. If there okay. is, a, you know, if they can work from home, they should. We haven't really received that yet. So that's that was our discussion. Good to know. We didn't see this uh, twelve uh, um, topics on the side here. Um, would have been helpful, I guess, if uh, when we were having our chat. <laughs> it's okay. I mean, you had the benefit of the of the training as a whole, so it's about your takeaways. Thank you, Merle. Really appreciate that. Excellent. Sounds like really good discussions. Are there any last questions before we wrap up from anyone? Put them in the chat. Unmute yourself. Happy to take questions. All right, if no questions, then I will send you the post-training presentations shortly. Good, I hope you found helpful and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank bye. you. Thank You're you very, very much. Bye. I'm glad it was helpful. Thank you, have a good day. <laughs> Thank you. You too. Bye-bye.